And now, from Greencastle, Indiana, Samuel Altman, reading an excerpt from his second prize intercultural essay, A Dash of Pepper in the Snow. I want to thank the Penn women for selecting me to win this honor. Thank you very much. And I also want to give a shout out to Rowena, Dan, Orlando, Cupcake, Jennifer, Lane, and Philip, all friends of mine who have convened here from New York, the Bay Area, Salt Lake City, and San Diego. So thank you. I used to be a newspaper reporter in another life. And my second newspaper job I took was at the Salt Lake Tribune in the early 90s. And so this essay is about my time as the first black reporter ever at the Salt Lake Tribune. So this is just the first section. The first time I ever caught a glimpse of Salt Lake City was from an airplane window at an altitude of about 10,000 feet in October 1992. From that vantage point, the Great Salt Lake looked like a dead tributary of the Mississippi River cradled in a desolate terrain, or picture from the surface of Mars. Turbulent, uh, turbulent air pockets wobbled our plane's descent into Salt Lake City International Airport. My stomach danced. Soothing words from the pilot meant nothing. It felt like we might crash. I hadn't flown much in those days. Apparently, this happens all the time when landing in the Rocky Mountains. Once we disembarked the aircraft, I noticed that Utah's sunshine seemed more sparkly than it did back in Missouri, Oklahoma a real-life postcard. The open space, crisp air, and snow-covered peaks testify that I had stepped into a dimension of America's landscape of which I knew nothing. A few months later, I took a reporting job at the Salt Lake Tribune on the Metro desk. At least one black person worked there on the copy desk. No one could remember in 122 years of publishing the Tribune if an if a, if if an African-American reporter had ever been hired. I'd become an accidental pioneer. The first week of, of January 1993, my new job began. Three colleagues, two reporters and an editor, invited me to have lunch at a Tribune hangout, Lamb's Grill Cafe. Owned and established by Greeks in 1919, the interior decoration hadn't changed much since the Woodrow Wilson administration. Dark wooden walls held pictures of George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. The carpet was a deep antebellum red. The, table, the tables covered with flowers and were draped with pressed white linen. We chatted, ordered our drinks and food. The room reverberated with conversations, a cacophony of voices. Lambs was a place Utah's movers and shakers, lawyers, businessmen, and politicians lunched, mostly white men in white shirts. I was the only black person in the establishment. Val, our waitress, was a blonde with her hair held up in a pen. She couldn't have been more than in her mid to late 40s. Think Flo from the TV, from CBS show Alice, the loud talking one who said, who told people, kiss my grit. From the looks of her weathered hands, she had led a rough life. The journalists at the table were talking about local politics when Val appeared with our iced teas and sodas. Soon she arrived with an armload of food. She paused, gave me a stern look, and asked, Sir, could you move your saucer out of the way so I could sit your clam chowder down? Yes, ma'am, I said, nodding. Thank you, sir, she snapped. That's mighty white of you. <laughs> an awkward quiet gripped the table <laughs> every time Val came back. I darted around the room to register facial expressions, and when she finally left, our table exploded with reactions. What the fuck was that about, one person <laughs> said. I don't know, another said. Did you hear what she said to him? I don't know what the problem is, I said, but let's see. I pretended her comment didn't rub me the wrong way. It had. Maybe it was just an innocent comment. Each time she came back to check on us, a funny feeling hovered. As we left the restaurant and walked back to the newspaper building, my colleagues expressed bewilderment. Back in a small town in southeast Missouri, I had overheard my roommate's father call me the N-word from another room. I was fluent in a number of racial remarks, but Mighty White was not among them. 
Apparently, Eddie Murphy made this line popular on Saturday Night Live. I didn't know what Val meant that day. I knew it didn't feel good. The remark initiated me into a three and a half year period of such uncomfortable moments. They came from the lips of other waitresses, overly friendly or watchful store clerks whose eyes followed my every move around department and convenience stores. In Utah, people gazed at me relentlessly. At six foot four, I didn't know if they were staring at me because I was black, tall, or both. I, I will say that years later I learned that Val had been married to a black man, so I thought I may reminded her of her husband. <laughs>